go through your introduction. Okay. And uh, then we'll get to the webinar. Great. Can, if you, as you're coming in, please continue to vote on the poll. Voting once. Mm -hmm. So welcome to datamanagementu.com's webinar series. I'm Anne-Marie Smith, and I'm the executive editor of datamanagementu.com, and I'm the moderator for today's session. We are happy to have the sponsorship of EW Solutions and OneTrust for this event. In fact, I can't wait to see what Leela can present. We have a poll, it's up right now, please, Participate in the poll so that we can structure our presentation to an extent from the results of the poll. If this presentation and discussion generates any questions, please post your questions in the Q&A tab. Don't post them in chat because we moderate Q&A much closer than chat. If you're interested in data governance, enterprise data management, metadata management, and several other topics, visit datamanagementeducation.com for online, on-demand, self-guided study for these topics. If you're on LinkedIn, follow Data Management U and make sure you connect with David Marco, the president of EW Solutions, and me. We're streaming this session live on YouTube. It's being recorded. So if you miss something and you want to go back later and review it, you can. Just go to the EW Solutions channel on YouTube. Subscribe and watch any of the webinars and all the videos we have placed out in that channel. The slides are available on the webinar website if you care to download them. And for download, we will soon have on our white paper section, a brand new hot off the presses web white paper from OneTrust on data privacy and the California Privacy Act. And the value of data privacy guidelines and standards to an effective data management program. Well, and that's an important white paper because in the November elections, there were some significant changes to CCPA, and I'm, I'm sure their white paper addresses some of that. So I think it'll be really valuable to it download. It definitely is. Definitely. If you stay for the entire webinar, you are earning one professional development unit for your hour here. A certificate on that will be sent within about 10 days after the webinar. You must attend the entire session. And please don't ask us tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., where's my certificate? It takes about 10 days to generate all of them. You will get one if you stay for the whole hour. I wanna thank our sponsors and our partners today, EW Solutions and OneTrust. OneTrust is a leading company in data privacy, data security, data governance, and data intelligence. We are happy to have some partner organizations help us promote these webinars, including the Institute for Information Management, the Insurance Data Management Association, and IAIABC, the International Institute for Workers' Comp. Thank you so much to our partners and sponsor. So what are we doing today? Well, the title is Data Intelligence, Where to Begin. What we'll do is Leela Jacob will talk about how organizations can build a path toward data intelligence with the right platform. She'll start by identifying the definition of data intelligence and then talk about data privacy and data security activities that enable the reuse of data show how compliance initiatives for core data governance capabilities support data intelligence and can leverage artificial intelligence and machine language driven discovery. We'll also see how policies that are incorporated in data catalog can help control data access, retention and use. 
There will be a poll result. David will talk about the poll results. And David and Leela will discuss one trust's capabilities in meeting these crucial learning points. No, David is going to grill Leela into the ground during the course of this. We're not going to discuss anything. I'm going to come in there with the hard hitting questions and we're going to have some fun. Doesn't that sound better, Leela? The other sounds too boring. Do your worst, David. (laughs) (laughs) She's up for it. This is going to be great. Okay, let me tell you about Leela. Our presenter today is Leela Jacob, who is the data governance solutions engineer for OneTrust. She's an accomplished data governance, data privacy, data security, and enterprise data management professional. And Leela has earned an information privacy certification, which is really important if you work for a company whose backbone is data privacy. Duh. Mm-hmm. We're really thrilled to have Leela as our presenter today, and I can't wait to see how the president of EW Solutions and our senior technical architect, David Marco, takes her apart (laughs) and then puts her back together again. No, no, no. It'll be fun. Um, It will be. Leela, I will stop sharing now, and everything's yours and David's. Thank you. (laughs) Absolutely. No, this is going to be a ton of fun, and let's look at... As Leela's bringing up her slide deck, and Leela, you can comment too. Let's look at our poll. The number tied for first place, most answers, but pretty well spread is each department or business unit interprets whether their data is meaningful, but we lack an enterprise view. However, tied for the top, 27% also is the data governance program has started to evaluate the concepts of enterprise data intelligence and how governance can support those. What do, what do, what do Leela and, and Anne Marie? What do you think of this poll? Any, any thoughts on what we're seeing? I think those are very telling results, David. Those are definitely some common scenarios that I run into all the time at One Trust. A lot of companies are just starting out, and there's a lot of dissimilar definitions around regions and departments, and that's definitely something that we do try to take into account. How do you want to communicate different definitions, different resources, and create that that big picture? So those are my initial thoughts. Um, Anne-Marie, David, anything that, that you would add there? I'm actually surprised that 20% of our respondents have an enterprise approach to data governance that includes compliance and data intelligence. I expect- I I think that's our audience. We have a pretty sophisticated audience. Um, But this doesn't surprise me because when we see business intelligence programs at companies, most have been disjointed. Marketing needs a report, so they just go build it. Finance needs a different report, they build it. Those reports never match up. There's no single version of the truth. There's no enterprise view. So th- these results don't fully surprise me because even Leela, you mentioned things like region and department. You pick very simple business terms. What about customer profitability, product profitability, these much more complex items? Um, I always love sharing the story. One of, one of our long-term client partners was Mayo Clinic. And we had to define sodium. And you think, sodium, this is on the periodic table of elements. This is going to be a five-minute discussion. You leave the room with 26 different definitions of sodium. Why? Because they would change one little molecule. And that's what the real world looks like. It's, it's much more complex than what we normally see. All right, I'm going to stop the poll. Leela, take it away. All right, thank you, David. And thank you, Anne-Marie, for that great introduction. The one thing that I would add is also avid knitter as of this past year. Uh, I crochet. We're gonna have to talk about that after after, Mm -hmm. uh, the webinar today, catch up a little bit more. But absolutely, as you've mentioned, I do have a major background in privacy, working with OneTrust. We're always, of course, focused on that underlying nature of privacy and trust overall. Uh, But today, of course, I'm gonna be discussing today's current data landscape and how OneTrust supports building a robust data governance program to bridge the gap between increasing volumes of data and the risk that it poses to organizations. 
Now, that being said, to build a trusted brand, uh, organizations need to employ a data strategy that transforms existing compliance initiatives into data intelligence. So true data intelligence, as we define it, builds upon compliance. So that background of, of privacy, everything is so interconnected, and it extends to the people, processes, and technology involved in the use and transformation of data into tangible business value. So when you look at a modern day organization's ecosystem, the sheer volume, variety, and velocity of data provides unique challenges for different stakeholders across the business. So like we've been discussing, lots of different stakeholders are going to be involved in this process, lots of different definitions, different types of data being gathered. There's a lot involved in this process. So Leela, as you, you have a term on this slide toxic data. Now I've heard of toxic people, but maybe you would like to describe what is toxic data. Yes, yes, absolutely. So toxic data can be uh, a lot of different surprising things depending on the, the organization here, um, but information relating to um, to specific, you know, individuals, information that we can, so I'll actually, I'll use an example here, rather than trying to define, you know, going back to sodium, lots of different definitions here, uh, but a good example of things that can be, you know, collected would be day-to-day -day organizations can collect information based off of just human interaction that might seem very innocuous. One thing that comes up a lot to us, um, any sort of systems that require a lot of you know, human input or don't have a lot of structure to them, I'll pick on Salesforce as a culprit here. Um, we can store information based off of just our interactions. So I've had lunch with Bob, uh, Bob keeps kosher. I wanna take note of that within Salesforce. Now I have some information that is going to be highly sensitive this is information that I wouldn't necessarily think twice about, but here, you know, now we have information that we are collecting that's surprising, that can be combined with other things, and now we have uh, a vulnerability within our organization. Right, and, th and that is one of the challenges, right? You mentioned about privacy. One of the biggest changes in CPA, CCPA 2020 is the definition of, of what is PII, much broader so if I'm able to piece some things together and be able to uniquely identify you, they definitely made that definition much more broad. So kind of, it's kind of interesting. So I think it's an important topic you bring up. Absolutely. And we tend to think of it as a piece of data, but we find much more commonly in, in practice, it's combinations of pieces of data. It's not just uh, here, I have a phone number. It's I have all of these pieces of information together that now generate this very specific result and this specific potential vulnerability for, for our company here. Absolutely. So it's no doubt that with these large amounts of sensitive information and at risk data, it can pose a lot of risk to an organization. So now that I've identified how much information, potentially toxic information I'm storing, it's definitely a threat to the overall business. So data breaches, regulatory compliance, uh, policy violations, breach of contract, potentially, we're opening ourselves up to a lot of risk because of the information that we gather. You know, as much use as it is to us, it can create vulnerabilities on the other side of the house, creates a lot of unique challenges here. So in this complicated landscape, the goal of any mature and data aware organization is to effectively discover and manage this situation. So there's more data to be leveraged than ever before, and the business wants and needs this data more than ever before as well. So the desire and demand for the business is exploding and the data is equal parts risky and valuable. So the more we understand you know, our, our, uh, our interactions with customers, the more we understand our data ecosystem, the more value it brings to this company, but it also exposes us in the case of data breaches, regulatory risk, breach of contract, et cetera. So the solution to this that we've found is integrating this approach to achieve real data intelligence. 
Now, compliance and privacy aren't separate functions anymore. So the future is managing both of these things together. And ultimately, to balance the paradigm, you need to be focused on compliance from the start as you extract data intelligence. So traditionally, compliance slows down the digital transformation, the business suffers, and value from the data is bottlenecked. So how can you sift through the data chaos, build a governance program that provides the business with data intelligence and remain compliant while doing it? That's the million dollar question here. Leela, can I jump in? Just you brought up, you, you, set, you set a point where you said, hey, you wanna look at compliance as you get the data. Why is that so important? Why can't we just look at compliance later after it goes through a few systems? Why is, why is it relevant to do it right up front? So I'm going to use another key word as I, as I explain here our perspective, privacy by design. I'm sure you hear that all the time. It's definitely baked into our process here. Before we even begin a process, thinking about the vulnerabilities, the potential compliance risk helps us to be aware of what we're doing all throughout the process. So rather than spending all of our energy trying to assess risk behind the scenes, we already have those processes in place. We're all already along the entire process, you know, running scans, assessing what we're doing so that at any moment we can answer to how we're interacting with data. We can always be responsible throughout the process rather than, you know, worrying, backtracking and having this bottleneck of data. Right. Well, in, the, in that's an area where um, knowing your data, this reminds me of a slide that I've used many times where a lot of times people, companies just want to jump to managing their data and to kind of give the whole point of the, the slide that I use, very similar. It starts with, you first need to understand your data. Until you understand what you're looking at, you can't manage a thing. So it, it's a really good point. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You have to truly know your data. That's, that helps you go, go deeper, really understand not just what you think you have, but what you actually have. Um, so the point I'm going to make here is going beyond metadata. We run into a lot of metadata scanning, metadata mapping, and that is fantastic in those instances where you're actually using information and storing information the way that you should be and the way that your policies would indicate. But we don't live in a perfect world. What we really find is that we can store things uh, not just uh, based off of policies, but by accident, by data drift, or uh, simply by misunderstanding situations or just capturing more information than we need. So you do need to actually understand what's being stored rather than just what a column name would indicate or what the purpose of that field might originally be. So the way that we, uh, we at OneTrust like to think about it is that um, we're going to look at the sufficient classification of data held in both structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data sources. So this relies on more than just initial definition, initial structure, initial best practices, uh, but we're actually scanning files of all those three types of data. So structured, semi-structured, and unstructured. Uh, columns in a structured database is, are often going to contain, you know, massive variances of data. So we might have, you know, a, a notes field, we might have uh, names, we might have addresses, but in reality, we're going to be storing a lot more information in those sources. So kind of to go back to my earlier Salesforce call out, you know, metadata is going to get us so far as we know that we have certain numbers of fields, we know that we're collecting in an ideal world email addresses, addresses, phone numbers, and then there are all of these notes and custom fields and what's actually going on there. So data that is wrongly classified or unclassified, that's not going to be part of our understanding if we're just looking high level best practice. So we're gonna to try to combine all of those things together within the demonstration as well, give you a little bit more of a, a visual understanding throughout the process here. Well, and those notes, you mentioned notes and customized fields, those are a nightmare to deal with because oh, yes. it, it can be anything and it's not even consistent in, in one customized field. They, uh, so we had a client partner where they had actually medical notes from a doctor that were actually images. And, and you could imagine trying to scan images for a doctor's handwriting, 
horrendously difficult. So those can be very complex. So I'll be interested in as you proceed forward on how you handle that because that is a sticky one. It really is. It really is. And I'm so glad that you've called that out. So that's definitely something that we're focused on as well. It's not just a uh, simple text. It's often very frequently image files, to your point, PDFs. Uh, we do have OCR scanning that I'll go into in a little bit later on, but that's a great call out. And that does certainly pose a challenge when you do get into handwriting, when you get into all this, all these different scenarios where that's still sensitive information. Even though it's a piece of paper, it's not within a database, we still need a system around that in order to, to understand it more deeply here. Well, and, and it is a challenge. You, you just hit on something. It just reminded me of a story. We were working with the FBI a number of years ago. And, and as you can imagine, piles of unstructured data, just audio, video, and multi-language too. Very difficult. And one of the interesting challenges we had is even data sitting in a column on a database, you can't always trust. So one of the interesting things we discovered, so Leela, I'll give you a little quiz here. This will be fun, is when a police station arrests someone and they don't have the, you know, a proper, they don't have a name that you can believe in, you know, like it's a five foot tall person and her name's Michael Jordan out of North Carolina. You're probably not buying it. Um, it you know, they have false credentials. Guess what? So police uh, departments have systems where they put in perp name for lack of better term. Mm -hmm. When they can't trust the perp name, can you guess what they many times will put in that field? I have an idea, but tell me. The name of the arresting officer. Oh, I was way off. That's very interesting. I, I, can I tell you how the, we figured this one out? So we're <laughs> at the Hoover building, piles, terabytes of data coming in. And we kept seeing like John O'Malley from Jordan, you know, like, or, or Saudi Arabia. And we're like, you know, John Manelli, you know, it's like, wait, you know, these are not folks born <laughs> in that part of the world. And so we started asking questions. We found out, oh, these were the arresting officer names of people who had false credentials. So, you know, this is why when you hear about, you know, five-year-old kids turning up on watch list, this, this is kind of how it happens. It, it ends up being a data problem. And it was one where nobody told us, we, we figured it out just because the names just they just didn't make sense based on culture and, and background. So I just thought I'd share the story. I was thinking about it. This is complex. Now I gave a very over the top story. All companies have this to a greater or lesser degree. So I'll, I'll let you continue. No, that's a great point that you bring up and a good example of, you know, a an enormous sensitivity level in that data, which I think keys up this next point pretty well. It's not just about identifying all these individual data elements, you know, names, emails, et cetera. Uh, it's also about understanding how sensitive each area is so that we can keep track of those specific places and look for those trends. Um, so in that scenario there, you know, frequency with those names that appear was a, probably a great tip off uh, this pro this individual this arresting officer probably would not have been arrested that many times so you can see those patterns <laughs> in data uh, naturally emerging there so that is a fantastic example these hierarchies are going to be very specific to, to organizations, of course, to law enforcement. They're going to have their own ways of categorizing, categorizing that information. Um, we're also going to look at it from the perspective of regulations that would need to be enforced because of that kind of information. Uh, that's of course, also going to depend on industry. You know, we deal a lot in the, the medical space as well. So calling out things like HIPAA. Um, anytime when we do capture information that's related specifically to those areas, having that hierarchy, having that organization is something that we do place a lot of focus on so that we can start to identify those trends and, um, you know, place the, the appropriate safeguards in those situations. 
couple additional things that I want to highlight here, getting back to the process in hand. So we've identified our data, we've uh, categorized our data, you know, we, ha we have um, arresting officers versus, versus criminal data here to go back to that example that I love. Uh, now we actually need a process that we're going to be, to be utilizing to control this web of data that we've identified and that's growing over time. So processes that can be continually reused and that can be impacted impactful across the organization, not just to the privacy arm or to the governance arm. One thing that I, I run into a lot, uh, particularly because One Trust has been around in so many different areas, talking to so many different departments for the same customers, um, a lot of people are using separate tools for these different purposes. A lot of departments are going to interact with the same data. So we do have you know, privacy organizations who are going to be privacy arms, the organization who are going to be focused on HIPAA, CCPA, GDPR, et cetera, you name it. But then we also also have the IT and risk side of the organization where we're focused on placing the appropriate security controls on that data, not necessarily concerned about privacy, but concerned about locking down information, not having data breaches. And then you're going to have people concerned about data quality. So all of these different individuals have one piece of the puzzle. And when this is being done in a silo, we have people duplicating work, we have a lot of inefficiencies, and also we just aren't getting the clear image when we have these separate tools. So one thing that we're focused on that you're gonna be seeing within the tool here is just creating that easier view so that when you do make those insights into data, when you do understand what you're looking at, that's going to be uh, obvious across the entire organization. You know, you don't have to make that inference and then have uh, the IT side of the house have to make that same understanding, take that same step into looking at the data in order to understand how to lock it down. You're all viewing the same information. You can all collaborate very easily. And Leela, can I jump in? Because you've hit a, bu a hot button topic for me. the silos of this. Oh, yes. I, I remember, I'm not going to name the organization, huge pharmaceutical. And we're brought in to say, hey, should we do data governance and data privacy enterprise wide? And the way we validated was they had nine data governance and privacy point solutions, just little departments doing three, four people doing something. They may even have a tool. They had seven more that were in, or five more in development, 11 more requesting funding, all of them point solutions, not one enterprise approach. And when you do this work in silos, they are not gonna do the work the same way. It, it will be disjointed. And you're, and there's still going to be huge problems. So I, I think, I really like this slide and your previous one. I, I would just urge our audience: we need to do this enterprise wide. We need to have a good structured approach because a siloed approach, I, we we have to rebuild this garbage all the time, and it doesn't work. So I just want to bring that up. And I would point out that it doesn't apply just to massively sized organizations. It really is a problem even in smaller organizations, because smaller organizations frequently do several things at once, just like bigger organizations, and they have a silo for this, a silo for that, a silo for some other process, and everybody's running at their own speed. Even smaller organizations tend to not think in an enterprise view, unless for some external reason they're forced to do so. Absolutely. And that lack of communication, as, as you say, Anne-Marie, that is not um, only a big organization problem. It's really easy to think regardless of situation, regardless of industry or size of a company, um, you know, IT department, that's not going to affect privacy. Marketing, that's not going to affect data governance. You know, there's, there's that assumption that uh, we really only need to look at our own paper when really we can be so much more effective, you know, looking outside of our specific or specific need or use case and looking at an organization's pain point as a whole and how we can collaborate, use the same data more effectively all together here. So I want to walk through just a couple of different use cases, uh, different examples before we move into the, the product itself. 
the first example here, processing information for a new purpose. We're going to say a business wants to use customer data for something entirely different that it hadn't been used before. So say we've collected information initially for marketing. Now we want to use that for not just a campaign, but for more uh, for, for a second step outside of the organization here. A business request for that usage is going to trigger a, a PIA. So we're kind of talking privacy terms here. Uh, we're sending out a request for that usage because now we have a different processing purpose. Uh, we're going to check the Europa for that legal basis of processing. And then depending on the legal basis, we have policies that we need to update. And we also have to get updated consent. So once the PIA has been approved, proper privacy updates made, then the access is given. But we might only be able to give access to data collected after updates because of the new purpose. Um, so here already in this example, we're touching a lot of different potential tools, a lot of different uh, needs, all because of one simple change within an organization. And this is already something that we can see, um, you know, there, there could be limited views, this could be very segmented. Leela, is PIA privacy impact assessment? Yes, thank you, Anne Marie. I apologize. I have a terrible habit of speaking in acronyms, uh, but yes. So do we all? Great call out here. Our second example, really quickly, I'm just going to run through these and then we'll see some examples kind of within the tool. Uh, but business, uh, this is requests a new department be granted to customer data. Okay, so here we're talking about uh, access within an IT department. We have a whole new process that we're going to carry out. Before that access can be granted, uh, there are steps that an, that an employee has to walk through. So we're talking about training courses, uh, reviewing and accepting policies. There's that word policy again. And as employees in that department complete these tasks, their access is approved. Any new employee joining that department has to do the same. So here we have a repeated process here. All right, so now we're going to get into how OneTrust is actually going to help with these, uh, these very siloed processes and requests. As I transition over into the demo itself here, are there any additional questions or points to bring up from the uh, presentation portion today? Okay, we have two. We have one that asks, why was the term toxic data used for personally sensitive information. This organization takes the term toxic data to mean data that's at dispute within the organization. So how would you define the differences between those two types of bad data? Um, great question. So we're definitely going to have some, some different definitions here. Uh, within toxic data, we can use that in a variety of different ways. Um, something at dispute, that might be a kind of an interpretation from a, a legal perspective. Privacy might view that a little bit differently. Um, so that was definitely a vague example that I used previously. I apologize for that. Uh, but does that conversation kind of help to, to address mm -hmm. the initial? Okay, yes. perfect. And one other question, uh, what's the definition of ROPA? What does it stand for? What does it mean? Perfect. So uh, for uh, the ROPA example earlier here, and I apologize again for all of my acronyms, um, we tend to use um, ROPA when discussing um, you know, processing activities, when discussing uh, purposes of processing. Um, Sorry, not a, not a great definition, but does that kind of, um, and then the actual uh, abbreviation record of processing activities. Okay, that's that's good. Thank you very much. Of course. All yeah, right. and we have a lot of friends out in, um, you know, the, the um, Institute of Information Management. They have a lot of people who really understand records management. So I'm sure they were all over that acronym, but I'll, I'll let you continue. We have so much to do. <laughs> yes, we have a we have a lot of content here. So I'm going to reshare so you can see my demo environment and just let me know if you don't mind when the series of tiles is coming across. Uh, oh, I see definitely. it. Fine. All right, perfect. So diving into the tool itself, I'm a very visual person. I find that this is going to to clarify a lot more than than PowerPoint can. I'm going to start with the actual automation. So identifying information, looking directly at the source to see what kind of data we have stored, categorizing that data. And then we're going to be viewing those results within our catalog structure. 
Uh, but as I go throughout, please feel free to keep those, those Q and A's coming. I'm happy to stop at any point to address any questions within the platform here. Jumping in first to the data discovery portion, what you're looking at here is our data discovery gallery. So this is where we're going to start interacting with systems themselves. So here we're going to be looking at web applications, databases, and file servers, file shares. Those are what we define as our sources here. So we're going to connect to them individually in order to get more, uh, more detail and we're actually looking at the information itself. But we do look behind um, security protocols. So what we're gonna be doing here as I launch a connection we use a term called worker node. This just means that we are installing this behind security protocols. Uh, going back to privacy by design, we always wanna make sure that we're scanning as close to the source as possible. We're not in the business of creating a data lake or copying this information over. Any information we look at stays at the source and we are just reviewing it and we're going to be working with metadata when we're actually in the tool here. So we'll be categorizing, classifying, and that's what you're going to be seeing. Within the tool itself, I've set up a connection to our, our test system. So we're using S3 as a quick example here. We're just referencing our credentials, sending our results in this case into the catalog. Very simple setup. You're looking at our, our wizard view. So we have essentially plugins that we utilize for connecting to known systems, systems we've connected to in the past. We also have custom connectors. So for organizations using legacy platforms, using uh, custom homegrown platforms, we do have the ability to connect to those as well. We're going to be able to fully control how we look at a system as well. So this is going to be completely determined by the individual organization, how much data they have in certain systems, how frequently they want to review changes to these systems. So the first thing that we're gonna do out of the gate is create a schedule. We wanna make sure that our catalog is as up to date as possible. So we're gonna be continually looking back at that source, refreshing our results here. And then we have certain methodologies that we can break down into how we want to look at data. So for example, here, going back to your doctor's note example here, uh, we do have the ability to turn on that OCR imaging. So we can look at, uh, at text files, we can look at image files, PDFs, and treat all of that information in the exact same way. So a note scrawled on a piece of paper or a, you know, something scanned into a, a system here, we can still read that and classify it just like if it was plain text stored in a database or an email. Some additional things I wanna point out really quickly. I get a lot of questions about volumes of data. We can control that within a scan really, really easily. So you can constrain it to a certain size or just certain areas of any systems. You can look at priorities first. You can exclude certain locations. This is completely configurable. You can scan as you go, continue to kind of build scans if time is of a concern here. And all of our results are gonna go into the same place. So we're looking at this review screen here. This is representing any systems that you continually look at. We're always surfacing changes. So you're not only going to know, you know in a, a first snapshot of your systems and how you use data, but we're actually going to be pushing those changes here so you know when you're storing different types of information, when uh, new things are occurring here. So for example, you'll see the metadata at that system level. This is us telling you the location, the types of information that we would expect based off of things like field names, and then what we've actually discovered. So you'll see here, we do have a mixed bag of what we would call helpful metadata, like our account ID and unhelpful, like this scanned document here, um, or you know anything that might be custom. I see a lot of just custom field two and things that are really unnamed or more technically named. So we can use that metadata when it helps us, but we're also looking at the actual data level. So here where we just have this document, we've still found some information here. We have actually a very high confidence score for names. We've looked at that data, we've found names in there. We don't need metadata to tell us what we expect to find there in that case, uh, but it can certainly also be very helpful in cases where data might be too specific. So an example that I like to use here, 
Uh, things like date of birth, you might want to rely more heavily on metadata like birthday, birth date, DOB, because the data is just going to give us a list of dates. So we're going to compare against both in that case. Uh, there are also instances, you know, where data might be encrypted inside of a certain area in a database, but we can still look at our results and we can still say, well, that column's named account ID or ID. So we can still use that information to help get us along. Some other examples, things that we're going to be using in this process here. Uh, this is just, just what we call our classifiers. So these are all out of the box. You can also add your own. Uh, but for example, here, if we want to find credit card numbers, we don't need metadata. We can just look at data and say, based off of formatting examples that are common to you know, an Amex or a Discover card, we can still flag that up, capture that information, and say, this is a credit card, even though we found it somewhere completely unexpected. The confidence scores here based off of the actual you know, examples that we're looking at are going to be determined based off of the individual conditions that we set up. So at any point I can come in here, I can add you know, a custom ID. I'm talking to a customer recently that utilized a rare eye disease, co eye disease code. That's something that they can define here. You can look for intellectual property. You can look for things that might be PII, that might not be PII. And just based off of the metadata that you have access to, any individual conditions that you want to look for, you can assign that high or low confidence. You know, we have a formatted Amex that's going to be 100% confidence. That's a very specific type of data. Or it could be something uh, where it's unformatted or maybe even truncated or encrypted. That's going to have a lower confidence for that kind of condition here. And we Lila, if I can jump in a little bit. Oh, of course. Uh, Confidence score to me is very useful because for those of us who've been doing this for a little bit of time, at one time we didn't have these things. We, we, we didn't have software that could help assign it. So we had to do it all ourselves. That's a lot more work. And, and as you mentioned, looking at fields like a date field is a terrific example. When, when you get a field and you see it's a date field, it, those tend to be very easy to identify. You can have Quite a bit of confidence that you've discovered a date field and even id fields where there's uniqueness in the number you're you're saying wait it's we always have a string of numbers and they're non-repeating these really can help lower the work the, the workload on our data stewards when we have software that can identify these things rather than having people manually do it all the time Absolutely, absolutely. So anytime that automation can come into play, that is absolutely key for saving time and raising confidence to kind of reuse that word here. So anytime you can find those patterns in data, we can identify that then automatically. And that's going to take a huge lift off of your review process and off of anything that you would typically manually hunt down. So once we have those patterns to, to utilize, and I'll use another customer example. I was working with the museum whose specimen ID coincidentally looked very similar to a social security number. We were able to identify you know, some good patterns, conditions that made it unlike a social security number, drop that in as a classifier, and now we're going to automatically pick up on that difference every time and sort social security numbers from those unique specimen IDs. And we're also automating even the approval. So once that's been trained, once we're seeing those high confidence scores, those confident matches against the data that we're looking for, we can automate that approval process too. So we can find you know, any range that we're comfortable with, maybe 70%, 80% in that confidence score, meaning we have really clear matches in our data to what we expect. We can go ahead and approve those. And then we're going to be getting into you know, our day-to-day -day interactions with what we've approved, what we're comfortable with versus you know, what we're reviewing. And in those is, samples, can I ask a question like, a lot of people don't realize social security number is not just a unique, first off, it's not unique at all. That's number one. When social security first came out, a, they gave an example of it. And many people thought the example was their number. So most of those people are no longer with us, but social security, not a unique identifier. And there is intelligence in that number. That's right. Unfortunately. Um, so in your sample IDs, did they have intelligence 
within the ID were what what I mean by intelligence certain characters let's say in slots two and three refer to uh, I don't know much about specimen codes but organic or non-organic or some type was, was there some kind of intelligence in that code yes yes there was yeah. so that's what made those conditions easy to set up as we uh, we're able to identify just based off of talking to them, what generates this code, what conditions should we look for? So yes, absolutely. Things like organic versus inorganic, date ranges, things like that can all factor in. Um, and then we can translate that into something like a regular expression. You know, this is the subset of digits that this section should fall into versus this and the formatting. So it's it all comes down to just defining that data, understanding what goes into it, and then it's it's very easy to scan for. Hmm. Perfect. So I'm going to transition over into the catalog. Spend about. Uh, five, 10 minutes in this, this last section here. But before I transition over, any additional questions for the discovery piece here? Have you ever come up with uh, or en encountered uh, a source that you found to be difficult, challenging, unable to bring in? Assembler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point, David. I bet assemblers are a rough one. Typically it is. Yes. So I can't speak to that source specifically just because <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't attempted to connect to that. I can say that, yes, there, all, there are always going to be certain challenges, um, especially once we get into legacy systems, things that wouldn't necessarily use connectors that we might use today. Um, so that is something that that does come up sometimes. Fortunately, we're blessed with a great development team. Um, I haven't worked on any any instances where we have not been able to connect to something that would fall under our typical purview. Um, but but great question. Thank you. And it's the challenge, those business rules in the fields, like your your sample ID. I, I really enjoyed that example. The <laughs> second I heard it, I go, I bet you there's intelligence built into that, though yeah. there shouldn't be. Just for the data modelers in our audience, you right. never build intelligence within a, a field is should mean one thing and one thing alone. But now I will be quiet or I will gobble up the last 15 minutes. Leela, take it away. No, it's a great point. I almost equate it with never put anything personal in a password, you know, but we're right. so attracted to patterns as people. So always something that we run up against. Yep. So moving into our catalog here, just getting into organization of data, associating policies, you know, the intelligence going into managing what we've discovered couple of different things going into this that I want to, to highlight with our next 15 minutes here. One element is the data dictionary. So this is where we're organizing by data source. So we've connected to a system. We've discovered data inside automatically. Now we're going to use the data dictionary to actually follow that logically, look at the structure, the schema, identify exactly where data is stored. So this is where we're really getting into the meat of how we're going to be managing information. The glossary view that I'm going to cover next focuses on how data is actually defined. So this is where we're going to get into democratization of data, you know, different departments, different regions, different aspects of an organization having different definitions. So how we can democratize the sodium definition, you know, we can store different variables based off of how it's utilized differently. Starting out with the dictionary here, I'm going to jump into a data source starting with Oracle as a good structured example. At our highest level view, we're looking at location information, ownership information, who is our data steward, you know, who is going to be responsible for the quality of the data that we find here, who's responsible for the allocation of access for business purposes, you know, who do we contact, what do we utilize, this is a great resource for those next steps and those, you know, deeper level understanding of how an organization is going to be using Oracle, and then we're going to be getting into the actual data that we found inside, so this is where data discovery is going to be powering a lot of this information. We have over on the right our categories of data. So thinking back to the, the presentation, you know, how do we understand what data we're using under different scenarios, what policies are going to apply, 
this is something that's automated as we find information in these systems. So for example, if I wanna understand a particular term, how it's stored within Oracle, I'm just going to our child objects here, you're gonna see all of our Oracle databases and then all of the tables inside that database. And finally, the individual terms or data elements that I've found in a particular table. This is calling out again that review process. So anything that I've flagged for review or needs a second look is going to be marked in orange here. Um, as an example, you know, we're finding custom fields. We're finding some information that might not quite match to our expectations. We have very sensitive data here. Uh, we have again a notes field where we're finding a whole jumble of information that we might not expect we can associate any of those terms that we're finding um, with specific uh, policies, with specific actions and needs, uh, just by simply associating it to tags. So this is what we were growing when we go back to that larger view of Oracle, and you see all of these classification tags here, that's what's powering that connection. So we're going to see based of, out of all the information that we're storing in Oracle, here are all of the classifications and the policies that have been applied. And we can get more and more specific as we drill down. And, and Leela, if I can maybe jump in, you're, you're attaching these tags based on the algorithms and the pattern recognition that, that you're applying to the data. As not, not that people can't manually do these as well, because of course having a live human being is always best, but still you're taking a lot of this out of, a lot of the manual work out of it because you could tell like, like your notes field, that's the kind of notes field, I think three, that's the kind of gets you into deep trouble. <laughs> that kind of custom notes field, what you add in it. Um, so I think that kind of automated tagging is really, again, it, 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 I tell people all the time, I love the field I'm in. Software has never been better than it is today because we used to have to do all of this manually years ago. Yes. And it's not, it's so nice to have these capabilities now. Absolutely. And as soon as, you know, we see that type of information being captured, you know, it's not just we've identified this in one place. It's also, but what else is it interacting with? Where else might this information be stored? Uh, so that's definitely something we take into account as well. Uh, we're going to be getting into to some next steps and things you can actually do, but understanding how these tables or views or fields in general are being built and connected to other areas. This is something that we automate as well. So this is our lineage across all of Oracle. It's telling you for that table that we're viewing here, what else is feeding into it? What else is it feeding? And this is built based off of primary and foreign key relationships and generated as we scan the system. So when we do need to take next steps, we need to clean up that notes field, we need to remove some of this information that we're storing perhaps erroneously, then we also know the other areas that may be affected. So I can take a, a task here within the catalog, assign this to an individual here and tell them to remove this information. I can also take a look at the lineage, the other areas, the other related terms that we've found here and see if there's anything else that needs to be, um, needs to be viewed as well. Leela, we have two questions on this topic. Okay. One of them is, do you use a knowledge graph and artificial intelligence to analyze active and passive metadata and provide some augmented type of intelligence. Absolutely. So we do use AI models in order to uh, to make some of our, our tags, make some of our classifications. That's absolutely something that is going into this process and something that's learning over time. Thank you. And the second question is, can the data dictionary have the capability to house the list of allowable values for a specific column and its definition? Certainly. So if I'm understanding that question correctly, it's um, more of this is the kind of definition, this is the expected formatting, this is what we would allow in this field. Yes. Um, so that's something that we, we absolutely do lay out here more of a feature of the glossary. So what we're going to do every time we identify a certain type of information, like a data element, that's going to be defined here within the glossary. So data discovery is populating this as well. It's also something 
can import existing definitions, create new definitions at any time. But we are laying out here for each of the uh, glossary terms, you know, formats, allowable fields. And this is also something that can be configured. So any data quality uh, needs formats that you need to keep track of, that's something that you can add as your own attribute, as your own tag to continually look for and maintain. Okay, I think that answers the question even more thoroughly than the requester asked. Excellent, I was using that as a jumping off point for, for one last feature to show. I know that we do have only a few minutes left. Mm -hmm. So last two things that I wanted to call out here, of course, the ability to search. So we can look for anything across the entire catalog, anything discovered through data discovery, find things like where are my uh, unencrypted social security numbers. And of course, everything is also captured in our dashboards as ongoing trends. Wow. This is impressive. David, any last comments? No, but I, I again, I, I think what's, what's relevant here is historically companies try to do all this stuff manually. And uh -huh. really now you're able to bring capabilities and using automated capabilities to me is where it's at. This exam, it's a, it's a nice demo. There's a lot of data in it, but it, as everybody on this call knows, when you get into global 2000 companies, they have millions of data elements and there could be thousands of data elements that just mean the same thing. And doing all that manually is, is an awfully long road to sled. So I think this is a great example of what you're able to do if you put in the correct processes and capabilities in place. Absolutely, great point, David. Are there any additional questions for me before I hand over the reins here? Um, not at the moment. I think you have all of two minutes, Anne-Marie. Yes, and that's okay because I can do two minutes. <laughs> Uh, we are thankful for Leela and David's presentation today. Leela, your presentation was wonderful. Um, I, I would love to see more of this product and learn more about data intelligence from one trust perspective. So perhaps you'll come back. In June, we're looking forward to a presentation on a enterprise data management assessment strategy and roadmap how one organization has been able to really improve the value of its data and its data management capabilities through assessing, developing a strategy and a roadmap and then implementing that roadmap. Andrew, Anne -Marie, can I jump in? Can yes. I jump in quickly? Don't miss next month. Andrew, we have known Andrea for years. I, we have wor I've worked with Andrea as is Anne Marie, super bright, has done as a longtime professional. She, she's just going to kill that conversation, bring so much knowledge to the table. So don't miss next month. I can't wait. Oh, it's going to be great. I've already seen a overview of this. I can't wait to see it as well. Thank you for attending. Thank you to our sponsors, EW Solutions and OneTrust. If you want a copy of the webinar recording and the slides, they're available at the URL here, ewsolutions.com, data management webinars. We will be sending you your certificate for attendance in the next eight to 10 days. If you're interested in learning more about data governance, metadata management, and other topics, go to datamanagementeducation.com. And so that you are alerted to all the content we have on DMU, Data Management University, especially our very valuable webinars, go to datamanagementu.com and subscribe for free. We will keep you informed. Thank you again. Have a wonderful 